Hello and welcome to episode 66 of the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. This is a show for fundraisers who want ideas and maybe a dose of inspiration to help you enjoy your job and raise more money, especially during the pandemic. And today I'm sharing the first half of a conversation I had recently with a very smart fundraiser named Will Robinson, who works for a fairly small charity called Become. In episode 62 of the show, Will's colleague Davinia shared some interesting ways in which her approach to team culture have helped them grow their fundraising results during the pandemic. One of those success stories has been the way Become has started working with the gaming community, encouraging them to raise funds for the charity. To me, one of the really exciting things about their achievements is that of the 65 people who raised funds through gaming for Become this year, none of them had raised money for the charity in any way before. So this gaming initiative was the catalyst for lots of new supporters, and some of them have now raised funds for the charity on three separate occasions across the year. Gaming is such a valuable, multi-million pound part of the entertainment industry, and in recent years some charities have started to take it very seriously. If you haven't done yet, but you want to find out more, I hope you find Will's findings helpful. Will Robinson, welcome to the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. Hey Rob, thanks for having me. You are very welcome. I've been looking forward to this ever since I had some interesting chats with your colleague Davinia, uh, one of which uh, actually we published on the podcast. Uh, and I've just been so intrigued by some of the things you've been doing um, in the gaming community within the last 14, 15 months. And I was really keen to uh, find out, find A, find out more, but but B, share some of those ideas with our podcast listeners. But typically I'm getting ahead of myself. Just before we get going into the content, um, you are fundraising manager at Become. Um, what's the gist of your charity Become? What does it do? So we are a national charity uh, supporting children in care and young care leavers. Um, it's still quite a small charity. Uh, so I think we're about... 17 staff at the moment um and and within that fundraising team we've just grown to a team of five um but that's kind of a, we're going for a bit of a period of growth but um yeah mm. that's that's become yeah and um i was fortunate to chat to davinia because she and and her her colleagues she's rightly proud of of um how well your charity is has done during this crisis um goodness knows it's been tough and, and it maybe it wasn't all plain sailing but um, as far as I understand it, it there has been a really serious fundraising growth uh, it, because of a bunch of things you've all been doing. Uh, and she talked about some of those on that other episode that I mentioned. But one of them she mentioned is this new project you've been doing working with the gaming community. Um, top line, what's the nature of that activity, that proposition? And you know, what were you asking people to do? Uh, and how well did it perform in, in this first one or two iterations? Yeah, so I've been aware that gaming fundraising has, has kind of arrived on the charity scene probably a good few years ago now, but it's been growing over, over the last kind of five years. Um, so it's kind of been on my mind. That was something I, I would love to bring to become. And that was kind of pre-pandemic and then the pandemic hit and it was kind of the ideal um, product to, to kind of fast track um, and, and help kind of plug a bit of that gap that, that we all felt with um, mass participation events all being postponed and or delayed. Um, so what it was, um, essentially we ask the general public um, and we, we wanted to ask both current gamers but also people who who maybe haven't gamed that much before um to play a video game um and the challenge was um uh, it was called the become players marathon so it was to play a video game for a marathon length of time um and and fundraise for that um for us through that challenge um much like a, a traditional challenge event and in terms of uh, top line results. It, then really, the, the meat of this interview is going to be lessons learned and how you did it. So that if someone's listening, they've been thinking about this and they they just don't know where to start. They have you know, we'll, we'll give them a, a boost and some encouragement to really go for it. But um, yep. in your first year of doing it, top line, how many people did you get to do it? Um, uh, top line, how much did you raise? Do you know the ROI? Yep, yep. So. 
So we've, we've hosted three um, kind of event weekends over our first year. Um, so the total across that um, was we just raised over £16,000 um, and, and our expenditure was about 3000 for that. Um, I'll let you figure out the ROI on that one. Um, <laughs> and then in, in the very first event, um, which was like our, 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 just our pilot, we didn't know how it was going to go. So this is what we hosted back in April 2020. Um, and, and yeah, we didn't we didn't have big budget, small charity. Um, we spent just over three hundred pounds in total, um, and um, and that raised five thousand um, or just over five thousand, which was like a huge success for us, um, and and kind of yeah, really encouraged us to to carry on and, and invest a little bit more. Um, but there were so many variables around April last year. Obviously, we just got into lockdown one. Um, Playstations and Xboxes were just like empty off the shelves in, in shops because so many people were, were buying them. Um, we were relatively new to market. So we were aware that there was a lot of things happening that maybe meant we were going to struggle to repeat that success. But we hosted pretty much the same event in March this year, 2021, um, to try and kind of minimize um the variables so we can really compare um and and we raised just over eight thousand so i think we, we've really like proved the concept um which is really exciting because it is a more congested market now um a lot of like big charities have got involved in ga gaming fundraising but i think the fact that we we've um improved on success proves that there's 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 enough gamers out there for, for all of us and i would really encourage um, more charities to try it yeah, it really seems to me that uh, this hobby is not going away any time soon. It really seems to be just growing ever more. And, and it was clearly growing as an entertainment market long before the pandemic came along. Um, in, in fact, could it, to help the, the listener potentially to kind of really take more seriously this as potentially an important part of their portfolio, because um, still, I think, although more players are getting into it, um, traditionally, lots of charities, maybe because of the nature of you know how they are led or the the age and demographic of, of where the decision makers are, they have you know some have not quite understood it or thought it was just for a particular age group or maybe and we can come on to this a bit later. They, they've been kind of skeptical about some of the associations with violent seeming games and so on. Um, but before we come on to that. Uh, just help us tune into the fact that this is not a market ch most charities should be ignoring. Uh, we, we, you, you have to really look look closely, given that how many people in the population are, you know, week in, week out doing it as a way to uh, spend time. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's not just teenage boys playing video games, which is kind of a, a misconception. Um, the demographics are across all ages. Um, like it's pretty evenly split between um, men and women. Um, and, and yeah, there's people of all all different kind of identities and groups who, who, who game. Um, and we're really seeing that in, in kind of those who support become. Um, I would say all charities will have some gamers within your current audience. Um, I we had become had quite a small database, so we knew we had to reach kind of new audience, uh, new audiences, and the, and the vast majority of our supporters are completely new supporters to us. Um, but we did have a couple who were already engaged with become, um, who were keen gamers. So uh, I, I would definitely stress that every charity will have some gamers in their current like uh, newsletter list and, and, and audiences. Mm. And so, in terms of how you got started right early on uh, i don't know if you're a keen gamer yourself and and so that that helped you already understand this community and it, its habits and you know what it was looking for um but right early on how did you find out more uh, to 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 make that very first pilot um uh, something that you could get on and try yeah it's, it's a good question and and by myself i'm i'm a part-time gamer um i gamed quite a bit when i was younger um can easily go into it now but it's, it's yeah uh i'm not like a regular gamer uh and and, and i 
didn't have a lot of the knowledge um, of, of the current scene. There's a lot of unanswered questions that I had. Um, and we're a really small team. We were a team of three from at the time. So it would have taken me quite a bit of time to, to kind of research all those answers. Um, so what was like hugely helpful is, is we already had one kind of just DIY gaming fundraiser um who was great like, he did a he did a gaming marathon on his off his own back in in a couple of months before um kind of we we, we launched and raised 150 pounds um so i, I can recognize his ex- expertise um and knowledge is like a massive resource um so i, I literally just got got on the phone and, and, and was just asked if he would be willing to um be a bit of an advisor to me um he was chuffed like that felt really good for him so he, he um he, he got involved and was like super helpful um and answered a lot of the questions that i had and, and really helped me kind of like fast track my own knowledge um in, into what what i should be looking at and how i should be starting that event um and i did yeah i managed to, to, to avoid a couple of dead ends because of his advice um but there was, so there was just plenty be- of Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Well, just That's to be right. clear, um, uh, as I understand it, though your charity is not large and you don't have a large database of supporters, my understanding from various chats with Divinia is people who do care about become and what it stands for really care. Uh, am I right to infer that that this was a person who who liked your charity and the, the great work it does for children, young people in the care system? He was, you know, he, he liked you anyway. He, he cared anyway. And off his own bat, he decided that the best way or a way he wanted to raise money for you was by doing a, a mini gaming marathon and getting his mates to sponsor him to do that. Yes, that is exactly right. Um, yeah, so what, it was totally reactive to us, that, that first individual. Um, yeah, and, the, and I just studied him and supported him like I would any other um, DIY fundraiser so to try and bring him close to the cause and build that strong relationship um, and, and, and show our gratitude and thanks. Um, and, and yeah, after the event, we, we were able to continue to build that relationship so, and he was really excited to be able to um offer his expertise to, to help us build a bit more of a, a, a gaming community and a product for for our charity mm. and there's just and i know it's obvious in a in a way but it is such an interesting uh angle charities need to remember is that if people care about your cause they may well enjoy giving you money or they may well enjoy you know doing a pub quiz for you or a fun run for you or whatever but you know the more we can see them holistically as not just you know, that kind of supporter who sends five pounds a month or the kind of supporter who is you know a, a company that supports but we see them as the whole person they're but usually if they care their mission is not to be a person who gives you five pounds a month or does a pub quiz for you their mission is to help kind of the bigger picture of what you stand for and if you see them that way out of a particular narrow silo and just reach out and have have deeper conversations almost always they're really thrilled to be more valued for their wider expertise um and some charities are really good at sort of uh, connecting with the whole supporter and um but but some sometimes i think we can be reticent especially larger charities can be reticent because any one kind of supporter is tends to be managed according to the income stream that that goes with it and um, but sometimes also we might be reticent about imposing on someone or not asking for too much whereas from this example and lots of others i've heard i sense the opposite i sense this person because you've given them the opportunity to help in these other ways that really bring all of their expertise sounds to me like this person is 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 a uh, more loyal and keen to help than ever before, precisely because you've asked him for more help. Yeah, that's definitely the case, and that that's um, shown through a, a number of different kind of gaming supporters. Now, like uh, I recognised that early on, um, and and knew that if I could um, ask more uh, gamers to help, they would yeah become more loyal to the cause, and, and they absolutely have. And, and some of them have taken part in, uh, in multiple events for us now, and, and are really close to the community, and are like intrinsic to the success of it now. Um, they're like really at the heart of it, and then that's really wonderful. And, and they're such kind people, and I'm, I'm so grateful to um. To, to have relationships with them myself yeah and um I'd, I'd love to go and drill deeper into various things you're saying but for now one thing that occurs to me is you mentioned you don't have a massive database so lots of this money that was raised through these three initiatives came from people who are brand new or relatively new 
for the listeners uh, out there, how do you go about uh, promoting a project like this and finding those people who who it might suit? So that's definitely true. I think we did a bit of a, a full evaluation of the whole um, year recently. Uh, I think we had about 65 individual fundraisers who who, who support us through the year. Um, and all of them um, kind of financially support become for the very first time because of gaming fundraising. I, and only two of them were already on our database, but they hadn't financially given off and raised before. Um, so 63 were entirely new to us. Um, and the key um, acquisition tool was, was Facebook advertising. Um, absolutely, we, we pushed quite a lot on, on organic social um, and, and we did use kind of MailChimp to our current audiences, which had some success. Um, but MailChimp ads kind of consistently across the three events recruited about 90 percent of our participants um and and yeah like it, it, it's a really successful tool hi it's rob and i just wanted to jump in really quickly to let you know about the bright spot members club which is where we've published the full learning bundle that will helped us to create if you're curious about how this training site works rather than have me explain i wanted you to hear from one of our members hannah who joined in march 2020 and who's made use of the resources ever since She's had a fantastic year, which has included doubling the income for her small arts charity compared to the year before COVID. And she credits the club with helping her to make this progress. Here's what Hannah said about why she's a member. Um, I think this way of learning for me just fits in much better with the with my workload. You've got so many different resources online that you can just tap into when you need them and so many different experts that you've brought to your programs that actually I think I would struggle to be able to persuade my board of trustees to spend hundreds of pounds sending me on a, a three, four day training course when actually there's a really good value for money in in your series. And Rob, you bring some really fantastic speakers and professional fundraisers to your series and um you know it some of the sessions may be very short but actually that really suits my style of learning so i think actually you know i i would say to someone just just give it a go if you'd like to find out more about how the club works go to brightspotmembersclub.co.uk forward slash join for now though back to the interview as i asked will for some more detail about how he promoted his gaming events in terms of Facebook, there is some budget needed then and therefore some risk that a charity would need to take on if they were going to do this. How did you manage that or did it become a no-brainer because you could, could see that investing X was generating Y number of people who were going to do the event? Yes, that's, that's definitely what kind of we were able to evidence after that first event, the first event, we didn't know how successful it was going to be. I was still pretty new to Facebook ads myself at the time. Like a, a lot of my expertise was self-taught. Um, like you don't have to be a digital whiz. Like it, it's, you can learn. Um, and yeah, we didn't have a big budget. As I said, we invested 300 pounds. Um, that was entirely on Facebook ads and that first um, event. Um, that 300 pounds generated uh, about 500 leads. Um, so it's just like name, email address, consent to contact. Um, and from those, I think it was about an 8% conversion rate at the time, um, which was, which was strong, um, and, and went on to, to fundraise that 5,000 pounds. Yeah. And, um, clearly Facebook advertising is a technique that charities could use to, to help with lots of different fundraising projects. Again, I know that lots of fundraisers are, are really good at this. But for those of us who haven't really done it before and it just seems like a sort of a, a dark art or something that's really technical and you need to be a, a, an expert on it, um, could you offer just one or two tips you, you you found along the way or that you wouldn't necessarily have known a couple of years ago uh, to help someone that, that apply if they are to do Facebook advertising at all and to do it well? I think you can do it pretty quickly and pretty, pretty, pretty well without even doing much testing. Kind of the beauty of Facebook ads is you can start like doing testing, which is called split testing. And you can, you can, um, test different images against each other and then you can test different copy against each other and then you can test different audiences against each other. And after a few rounds of testing, you, you know, you've got this ad that 
has like an image and, and copy that resonates with this particular audience and then you can just continue to to run that ad um but at the very start we we we, we I didn't know kind of how to start. So you, so you can just test like really small budget. You can have 50 pounds um, and, and just put like a, like a kind of successful organic ad. You can use evidence from organic, also organic post. So if you have like a, a post that had some engagement, you can just put some money behind that um, and, and, and see how it generates um, those leads. Cause I would say the most successful, most success we've seen through um, Facebook ads has been for like events recruitment at the moment. Like, yes, we also use it for um, kind of our, our general appeals to raise donations um, for events recruitment is, is definitely been where we've seen the most success. Um, so that's, that's where it is about generating those leads. And a good tip I would say is um, trying to gather the information um, within platform. Um, so rather than sending them to your website to sign up there, um, and, and, and give that email name and consent to, to contact there. Um, that's a massive drop-off point. Um, so if you actually gather the, the, that information within Facebook, so, so people will see the post on their feed, um, they'll be, oh, that looks like a really exciting gaming challenge for like a good cause. Um, yeah, I want to I learn more. I'm going to enter. Um, they'll quickly type in the details. That's really like accessible, quick and simple. Um, and then you've got that lead and then you send um, like an exciting like uh, first piece of communication. So we use MailChimp. We try and send that within like 24 hours. Um, and, and, and then you've got that next call to action, which maybe to set up a just giving page um, or, or join another part of the, the community. Right. Hope that okay. helps. Yeah. Thank you. And that reminds me of something else. I think I, I, I read a blog you wrote at one point about your, your learnings through this. And that was to do with a different platform. I think it was called... Um, Discord. In fact, before we get to Discord, maybe the the first most useful thing is to talk about Twitch and or uh, platforms like Twitch. Uh, again, for gamers out there, apologies for my seeming ignorance, but for those of us who are not familiar with Twitch and the like, what yep. is it? How does it work? How does it add value to the gaming experience generally or, or anyone doing some kind of streaming or sponsored event? So, as I said earlier, our first gaming chance, we, we wanted, we were targeting a really wide audience. So, people who hadn't really gamed before, and some people who are kind of like really veteran gamers. Um, and what we saw um, was that we were getting a lot of people sign up and join who are kind of beginner streamers. Um, so, what a streamer is, um, is someone who has a live feed, a live stream of themselves playing the video game to a platform like Twitch. Twitch is the biggest platform. If you just, search twitch like just have a look yourself um and you'll see like hundreds of thousands of gamers live streaming the, themselves playing a video game usually they will commentate whilst playing um, and they'll engage engage with a number of viewers who are watching them play live um, and the viewers have like a chat box so they can like ask um questions or uh, um have a conversation and then the streamer um, will will be able to read that chat feed at the same time as playing the game and, and engage with that audience. Uh -huh. Great. So now I'm getting a strong sense of just why this works as a fundraiser, because just like going on a fun run together or doing a pub quiz together or whatever it might be, uh, so much of the gel is this human connection between people who care about the same things and or are focused on the same uh, topic and it's as much about the banter and the connection as it is about, you know, the fundraising challenge or, you know, or, or, or what or the game itself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, again, a good learning that we, we saw was, was people set up their fundraising page like maybe weeks in advance of the event but like a couple of days before like so we hosted our event over a specific weekend and a couple of days before uh, we were on like 500 pounds for that five grand so i was like oh this is like doing okay we're like we're, we're we've broken even so it's fine um, but it took me a lot of time so i was a bit worried um but essentially like when people stream they they fundraise during their stream so a lot of people went from zero to 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 500 pounds like in an evening um because they're asking their live audience 
audience to donate that's who's donating um like we were really encouraging people share it with your friends and family just like a traditional um fundraiser um but so many of them will fundraise only with that audience that they have um but a lot of them have like like really strong bonds with with, with their community people who will come and watch them stream like once a week or, or multiple times a week um because either they're, they're like consider them like a close friend um or they just love their chat um and and really just really enjoy it and it's just a piece of entertainment for that viewer um or finally the the streamer may be like really good at a specific game that a viewer likes to watch and pick up tips um so again like they've got really strong bonds and when the stream is asking for donations people will donate um and then there's a whole of a, a whole of a, um additional layer of like asking for incentives and and, and streamers will do funny things they'll paint something on their face if you donate 10 pounds um, and and yeah streamers will come up with incredibly creative ways to incentivize their audience to, to to make donations um which is great so yeah that five grand vast majority of it came like during the weekend of the event great so um is it true that like with lots of fundraising um there's complex reasons why someone might want to do a good thing for charity and one of those in most cases is, you know, they care deeply about the cause and they really want to make the world a better place. Um, but another of them is, is there's an element of gaining something in return. And I, I think I read in your blog that, that uh, for many people, a part of the attraction of, of doing this for a charity is it's an extra chance to grow followers. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've really seen we can you can really align kind of your goal with these kind of like beginner streamers or charity can align goals so like you can get like an everyone wins um scenario which is beautiful um so kind of the main goal of these beginner streamers is to grow the number of people who, who are watching their stream um because ultimately um twitch will pay um essentially pays streamers per viewers um so if you start getting like 100 200 500 viewers per stream um some of these streamers will get be getting paid like hundreds of pounds a month if not like thousands of pounds a month so uh, some streamers once you get mid high level streamers it's their full-time job um and, and that some of them are getting paid a lot of money um by twitch because it's, it's bringing obviously people to the platform um and twitch is throwing some advertising out obviously that's that's their goal um so that's what the streamers want to do. They want to increase the number of viewers on their audience. Um, and a charity event can help do that. Um, for one, it offers them like a bit of a special event um, that they can engage their audience with and build up to over like a number of weeks. Be like, definitely come in on this this uh, this weekend because we're doing a charity event. It's going to be great. There's going to be incentives. Um, it's going to be so fun. Like You can help me like paint my face, um, all of that. Um, and equally, um, at the same time, we bring the, all these participants together into a community where they can all support each other. Um, so they all give each other kind of a follow. They'll all drop into each other's streams. Um, what's a really kind of exciting thing is called um, something called raiding, um, where if you're a streamer, you've got like 20 viewers watching you and you, you're having a break. Um, so you're going to stop streaming for an hour. Um, you can choose someone else's stream to raid. So you send your audience, those 20 viewers, automatically to that other person's stream. So it's that really wonderful thing that we saw because like all our participants were like building really strong bonds with each other. They were like raiding each other when they're having breaks. So if you're someone who has never had more than like three viewers on a stream before, and suddenly you get raided by like uh, one of your the, one of your friends you just met, and now you've got 25 viewers for the first time. Yeah, that's so that's like a that's a big deal. For for that person and that was a huge opportunity for them to to to, to engage with them and, and hopefully some of those viewers will give them a proper follow and, and maybe come back and watch them again so it's um a charity event can be a great opportunity for, for these like small level streamers to, to to build their audience yeah and i i read of some of the people who uh, joined you and, and raised money for you that first weekend uh, and then ca definitely came back and raised more the next time and more, more the next time. And I'm getting a sense that it, it wasn't just about the, the amount of money and the difference they were making. I just see how enjoyable this is, how thrilling this is to be part of this experience in, in various ways, in addition to the, the, the good that it does. I'm curious about um, way the kind of these bells and whistles that make that whole thing more fun. Um, is that something that on the platform there are these various options to incentivize people to give in the next 10 minutes so that I'll do this challenge or 
you know, pitting do donors against each other or, you know, are they on the Twitch pla platform anyway? Or do, did, did you create some kind of toolkit for things people could do and or the amount of you know, the difference, the an amount of money could make to your cause? And, or, and, and you already mentioned that a lot of it is, is just self-generated because these are creative people and they know what their audience liked or they know what they would find fun. What's the mix of um, how you create that, that added value within the event? Yeah, it's a really good question because it's something we're working on now to help kind of these new streamers build that all bells and whistles stream um because for some of them they don't know the answers to that question um and and they'll look to us or the become players community to, to ask the tips on how they can do it um because they've got that ultimate goal of, of being like a good streamer and, and building their audience so they want all the bells and whistles um so it's a combination of, of what you what you just mentioned in terms of, of some things that we created for them um so we created or i created literally on canva so i didn't i didn't use anything advanced i would create kind of um a, a cheat sheet so which can include like a, a donations um incentives list so uh if, if i don't five pounds i'll do x if I don't ten pounds i'll do y and um, but again but some of them can be blanks so encourages uh streamers to come up with their own fun incentives um and then beyond things that we create uh yeah there's kind of integrations between Twitch and fundraising platforms. So, and, and the good thing for gaming fundraising is all the fundraising platforms are kind of competing with each other to offer the best experience. So we use, we're using Just Giving at the moment, um, uh, who will be pleased to hear me plugging them. Um, we started using Just Giving at the start because I knew it, like I was comfortable with it. Um, I didn't have to learn a completely new platform, um, which always helps. Um, and, and a lot of the general public know and trust Just Giving. Um, but Just Giving, to be fair, like are investing quite a lot in their integrations with Twitch. Um, so that can be um, having a live donation bar on the Twitch stream. Um, so when someone's streaming live, you can watch or, like on the screen and you've got the donation bar. So when someone makes a donation, um like the bar goes up um etc etc um and then but then there are other platforms out there so there's one called tiltify um which probably everyone's heard of um so that's a that gaming fundraising only platform um it's an american platform um they're still learning like kind of like the uk market um and, and they are a bit expensive if you want to get all the data um so yeah there, there's it's, it's not something we're looking to use any uh, anytime soon, um, but it's, it's something to be aware of. Um, but yeah, to come back to your question, yeah, it's a combination of, of things that we can create um, and, and integrations with with kind of like the fundraising platform. Um, and something we're doing right now is um, there's another gaming supporter, someone called Mike, who's awesome. Um, and he's like chuffed to um, have been asked by me to create some how-to videos um, to do that integration. Because um, again, we, we always ask for feedback all the time and sometimes it, it, they'll say, oh, maybe some more tips on how to actually get the fundraising started. Um, so we're hoping to create those how-to videos um, with Mike's volunteering help, um, which will quickly just guide people through. You, you simply go on just giving you sign in, you make your page, you like copy and paste this piece of code and uh, paste it into Twitch and, and suddenly they're, they're integrated and people can go donate live. Will, thank you so much. Uh, I'd, I'd love to go on and on, but I, I know you, you've got plenty to get on with uh, and can go and get back to your day job. Um, but thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for sharing so many uh, examples, uh, tips of things you've, you've learned along the way. Um, I look forward to um, you know, watching your, your charity's continued uh, activity in this space because it, it se seems you've got plenty more plans and, and um, it's working already and you're determined to, to keep working with this community. Uh, best of luck with your fundraising and I will catch up with you soon. Great. Thanks, thanks again for having me, Rob. Thanks, Will. Bye-bye. See you. So I hope you found Will's insights and advice were helpful. If so, do remember to subscribe to the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast today so that you never miss an episode. For a full transcript and a summary of the episode, go to the podcast section of our website, which is brightspotfundraising.co.uk. As I say, this episode was an excerpt from the full film interview I did with Will as part of a learning bundle for the Bright Spot Members Club. If you want to see the full learning bundle, it's one of dozens of films and weekly live fundraising masterclasses that we provide to fundraisers through the club. To find out more, 
go to brightspotmembersclub.co.uk forward slash join. Just before we finish, I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who's been spreading the word about this show on social media or to your colleagues, helping us to get this content out to as many charities as possible at a time when fundraising is so challenging. And Will and I would love to hear what you think about this episode. We're both on LinkedIn and on Twitter, Will is at Will underscore capital R zero B-I-N-S-O-N and I am at Woods underscore Rob. Thank you so much for listening today. Best of luck with your fundraising and I look forward to sharing more Bright Spot examples with you very soon. Bye.